In this, our 20th lecture, we continue to explore life lessons that we learn from the great books, and our theme is adventure. We've looked at the venture of Odysseus coming out of the Trojan War, and we continue with the theme of the Trojan War in this lecture on the Philoctetes, produced by Sophocles and produced in the year 409 B.C., one of our most moving and profound of the Greek tragedies. It is a story of war. It is a story of suffering. It is a story that if war is anything, it is not one great adventure. And you would think that people would sooner or later learn that, that war is not one great adventure and that wars don't solve anything. And we tend to believe today that everybody agrees that war is a bad thing. And we also tend to believe that democracies don't want wars. And that if we only had democracies spread all over the world, there would be no more wars. And also, if we only had enough education and everyone was wise enough, they would not resort to war. Well, that's dead wrong. And the poet Sophocles tells us that is dead wrong. And he told his Athenian audience that was dead wrong. We looked at one of his earlier plays, The Ajax. That was produced in 441 B.C. That was the story of the Trojan War as well, and how Ajax, in his outrageous arrogance, in his determination to be the greatest of all the Greek warriors, killed himself when he was denied the armor of the hero Achilles. And in the Philoctetes, all those years later, Sophocles turns again to this question of war and what does it mean. In 409 B.C., the Athenians were in the very midst of the greatest war in the history of Greece, the war between Athens and Sparta that had begun in the year 431 and would last all the way down until 404 B.C. And Sophocles had grappled with this question all these years. How had we gotten into this war in the first place? Because the Athenians were a democracy, we have seen that they were the first government in history based on the ideal of the greatest good for the greatest number of citizens, that they believed that government of the people, by the people, for the people, based on majority rule, that all decisions of war and peace, of taxation, were made by the Athenian people in their full assembly. We have seen how they also sought to educate themselves for this awesome responsibility of self-government. The art, the architecture of Athens, and above all, these dramatic performances themselves were to provide a common public forum to discuss the great issues of the day. All of these plays had a religious level. They were meant to explain the ways of the gods to humans. Each had a moral level. They were meant to show that every political action has moral consequences. And finally, they had a political level. They were set in the distant past, like the Trojan War. However, each one of them commented directly on the affairs of the day. And so, in his Philoctetes, Sophocles commented on the Athenian policy that had continued this war. The war had begun in 431 under the leadership of the wisest, wisest of Athenian statesmen, Pericles, himself trained under the wise men of the day. It's Pericles who believed that every political issue could be solved by reason. Pericles who believed that man is a measure of all things. He had led the Athenian democracy, though remember his fellow citizens had to vote for it, he had led them into a preemptive war with Sparta. Now, the world was tied together in an economic unity. It was believed that warfare had become so destructive that the next war might be the last war. The Greeks had a common enemy in the Persians, but Pericles convinced the Athenians, and they didn't need that much convincing, that Sparta was a terrorist, evil regime out to destroy Athens. And so they began this war in the belief that it would be quick and glorious. And instead, it went on for 10 long years, down until 421. 
There were warnings, and Sophocles brought out these warnings. The great plague hit Athens in 430 B.C., and in 429, Sophocles had produced his play, The Oedipus, about a statesman, the king of Thebes, who believed that human reason could solve all things and suddenly found himself confronted with a terrible plague. And he had turned in the midst of this play to tell Pericles, you are Oedipus, you are bringing this ruin upon us. Let us learn from this plague. It is a sign from the gods. But the war went on and Pericles himself died. And finally in 421, the Athenians made peace. And Sparta and Athens made a peace based on going back to what they had possessed before the war. But in 415, the Athenians, not having learned a thing, voted another preemptive war. And they attempted to conquer the island of Sicily. And for two long years, Athenians died around the city of Syracuse until utterly defeated. They had lost thousands of men and hundreds of ships there in Sicily. You would think that they would learn from that. But Sophocles, who was appointed to a high post after that because the Athenians said, you were right about this all along, it's a very bad idea. They still didn't give up. And they continued the war. And in 409 BC, they were waging the war, the Athenians were, with all the power that they could muster. Now time and time again, the Spartans tried to bring about a negotiated peace. But the Athenians had become convinced that they had to stay the course, that to surrender to the Spartans would mean disaster. It would be proving that they were weak and the Spartans would come after them. And in 409 BC, Sophocles produced his Philoctetes. Philoctetes was a hero who had served the, the hero Hercules so well that when Hercules was dying, he chose Philoctetes to light his funeral pyre. And in return, he gave Philoctetes his bow, which was an invincible bow. Philoctetes possessed that bow, and he was so proud when he was chosen among the heroes then to go to Troy when the Great War began. Now you'll remember, and we mentioned this in an earlier lecture, the Trojan War itself began as a preemptive war. Yes, indeed, Helen had been carried off by Paris, but she had gone willingly. But the Greeks convinced themselves that if the Trojans would commit that act of terrorism right there in Greece, carrying off this wife, Helen, that what would they do next? So they launched this great expedition, just the same way the Athenians had launched their war against Sparta, believing that it would be a quick and easy war. And instead, it dragged on. But Philoctetes went in the first bloom of the youth that sailed to Troy, along with Achilles, along with Odysseus, along with Agamemnon and Menelaus, all these young heroes eager for the glory of war. But they landed on an island. They were going to get some water from the island. And while they were reconnoitering around the island, Philoctetes entered unawares a shrine of the gods. And in vengeance for sin he didn't even know he was committing, he was struck by a snake, given a wound, and the wound began to fester. And it turned all pussy and ugly, and then it began to smell. And the Greeks said, we cannot keep you on ship. You smell terrible. We're going to leave you here. And Philoctetes begged them, please, please don't leave me here. And they said, no, we're going to Troy, and you're going to stay here and die. They barely left food enough for him. But all the years afterwards, he stayed there on the island, using his bow to hunt a few little birds, lay there stinking, his foot never healed. In terrible pain, the pain would come on Philoctetes in a huge seizure, sweeping over him in darkness and all but killing him. But time and time again, he revived. And all those years, the war went on at Troy. And they died of plagues. They died of the cold. They died in the battle. And the war kept on because by that time, and we're now in the 10th year of the war of Troy, neither side could surrender. There was too much honor at stake. 
they could not make a negotiated peace. In the midst of all of this, the great hero Achilles was dead. And many of the Greeks said, if Achilles is dead, then we never can conquer. Let's give it up as a bad idea and go back home. But we can't. They captured a soothsayer of the Trojans. Helenus was his name. And they questioned him. And under dire duress, he told the Greeks that if they could come back with the bow of Hercules, they would conquer Troy once and for all. Well, the bow was with Philoctetes, and they prepared to go and get it. But they knew, Menelaus and Agamemnon, the leaders of this great expedition, that he hated them. They had been the ones who had decided to leave him there, and they had been advised to do this by Odysseus. Well, they sent Odysseus to get him, but they knew they needed another element to sway Philoctetes. They had to trick him, and they sent with them the son of Achilles, Neoptolemus. He had been just a child when Achilles had sailed off to war, but he had come now to avenge his father, and he had just arrived with the troops there at Troy. And once again, you might ask the question, why do young people keep joining up? He knew all the horror of this war, how he'd carried away his father, but he was there and looking for glory in war, hoping to be the champion of his father's memory. So Odysseus, a crew of sailors, and Neoptolemus sail to this terrible island, the island of Limnos, evil and seen almost deserted. And they arrive, and there they seek out Philoctetes. First, they don't see anybody. And they wander around the island, and they see this pathetic little cave, and a little blanket inside it, and a little rough-hewn cup. And they see the filthy rags that Philoctetes has to wrap his feet in. This must be his lair, he must be nearby, and they hear groans of pain, and they see this ragged figure, a man old before his years, making his way up the, the rugged cliffs of the island. And he sees them from afar, and he doesn't know who they are. And he says, who are you to come and disturb my agony? And they answer him, you're speaking Greek, he says. I thought I would never hear that language spoken again. Oh, I'm so glad you have come. Tell me, how go things far off at Troy? Why have you come? Who are you? And it's just Neoptolemus. And Neoptolemus has been told by Odysseus, lie. And Neoptolemus says, but, but it's wrong to lie. And Odysseus says, we'll lie today and win and be honest tomorrow. But lie to him. Tell him I have no involvement in this whatsoever. Tell him that you have come simply to take him back home to show vengeance upon the Greeks. Tell him that you arrived there in Troy and you wanted the armor of your father, Achilles. And the Greeks had chosen to give it to me and they wouldn't give it to you and they denied you that honor. So you have gotten mad and you're going back home. And to show him further, you're going to take Philoctetes with you. The Ptolemus feels worried about this. But he begins to spin out this story. And Philoctetes says, you mean you'll take me home? You are so kind. I will trust you entirely. Then suddenly when these terrible bursts of pain come over him, and he blacks out in all of his agony. And Odysseus shows up and says, take that bow from that poor old fellow, and we'll just escape. All we need is the bow. I can't leave him here to die. Why? He's pathetic. We just can't leave him to die like this. If we take him back to Troy, he'll just smell up the whole place. Leave him here to die. We've got other archers who can use the bow of Hercules. But Neoptolemus refuses to leave Philoctetes, this pathetic creature. And Phil Philoctetes is held in the arms of Neoptolemus. And he bathes his foot. And Philoctetes comes around, and Neoptolemus is still there. And he said, you didn't desert me. You could have gone away. Yes, I could have gone away. You're taking me home now? Well, old fellow, 
actually what we've got to do is go first back to Troy. But you told me you were Neoptolemus and you were leaving in anger. Yes, well, I lied to you. What else have you lied to me about? Odysseus is here. Oh, of all those in the world I most hate, Odysseus. I despise him. Oh, I will never go back with you to Troy. Tell me the whole story. Well, it's like this. We can only capture Troy if you use the bow of Hercules, and then we will conquer. I will never do it. You people deserted me here, Philoctetes, lie, letting me lie and suffer here all these years. Are you really Neoptolemus, the son of Achilles? Yes. Then you dishonor your father. He would never have lied to me like this. I know, I know it was wrong and I'm sorry about it. Then, you've got my bow, give it back to me. And let the Greeks die around the walls of Troy. Take me back home now. And Odysseus shows up and says, you wretched old fool, we'll just take it from you by force. And the weak old man says, I'll destroy it first. I'll hurl it into the sea first. And finally, the god Hercules comes down himself. Having been welcomed among the immortals in heaven, he now comes back down and says to Philoctetes, you must forgive. Give them the bow, sail back with them, and the city of Troy will be captured, and you will have your glory. Go back, Fort Troy, there is the son of the god Apollo, Esculapius. He will cure your wound and bring you ultimate health and glory. And so Philoctetes chooses to go back to Troy to forgive the great wrong that is done to him. And by this man who has suffered so much, the Greeks will finally take the city of Troy. It's an interesting message produced in this year 409 B.C., when the war is still raging. And to us, with our modern values, it seems a statement of the needless suffering of war, does it not? And of all the pain that comes out of war. But we must also ask ourselves the question, why did the Athenians keep on with this war year after year after bloody year? Their values in one very important way, differed profoundly from our own. If you had asked a room full of Athenian men, for only men were citizens, and the reason men were only citizens is that citizenship was dependent upon your carrying out the obligation of military service. Their army was entirely a citizen army, and only those who could carry out the obligation of military service were citizens, and so women were just passive citizens. They had the protection of the laws, but they were not full-fledged citizens and did not vote. And because these dramatic performances were part of your civic duty, you didn't pay to go to these performances, you were paid to go to them. There were no women present. There were only Athenian citizens and only males. And if you ask a room of those male citizens, what is the noblest thing you could do? Every one of them would raise their hand and say, it is to die for your country. And to the Greek, to serve your country as a warrior was the very apex of manhood and of civic virtue, of your patriotism, of your willingness to put your own self beneath the good of the country as a whole. And the Athenians were quite convinced that they must never give in to the Spartans. And what is the ultimate theme? What finally happened at Troy? Did the Greeks finally win? Yes. They stayed the course and held on to the inevitable victory. And that was the lesson the Athenians derived from the Philoctetes. It had this broader message and it had an immediate political message. It had a message for the recall of one of the most remarkable figures 
ever to stride across the Greek historical scene. Alcibiades, the son of Pericles. In 415, Alcibiades, who had been raised by Pericles, Alcibiades was actually his nephew, but the Alcibiades' father had died early and Pericles had adopted him, and raised the young Alcibiades with every advantage of education. Alcibiades was handsome at every stage of his life, and he was a master speaker and politician. But unlike Pericles, who simply wanted to be leader of a free people, Alcibiades was determined to make himself dictator of Athens. And in 415, it was Alcibiades who convinced the Athenian people to undertake this preemptive war in Sicily. It was Alcibiades who led them to the walls of Sicily. And then, at the very moment when Sicily seemed about to fall, his political enemies had trumped up charges against him, and he had fled into exile. And Alcibiades had gone to Sparta, and there amongst the Spartans he had given them the key to victory to send all possible aid to Sicily. Alcibiades had then fled to Persia and given advice to the Persian king about how to let both Athens and Sparta wear themselves out. So in other words, he was a traitor. But in 409, the Athenians desperately needed victory, and they wanted to bring Alcibiades back. And Philoctetes has as his message that Alcibiades is like Philoctetes. He has been wrong. He never was a traitor. In his hands lies the key to victory. Bring him back. So there's the immediate political purpose of bringing Alcibiades back. And there is the longer message. We have been in this war all these years. Let's stay in it to the end. It might have been folly to begin, but it is greater folly to withdraw. And so the Athenians stayed the course. In 407 B.C., Alcibiades lost one battle. He was exiled again. And the Athenians stayed the course until they met final and disastrous defeat in 404. And their empire was stripped away from them. And Alcibiades himself would die in miserable exile. He could never keep his hands off of women. He had gone back to the court of the Persian king, been sent into a kind of exile in the center of Asia Minor. He'd been given a guard that told him, you can do anything you want to, but leave the local girls alone. And there, he had seduced a local girl and been killed by her brothers, dying in the arms of his last mistress in a muddy village in Asia Minor. All that promise wasted as though there were also the promise of Athens, and it had lost everything. And so as he pondered this final disaster of his country, Sophocles, as he came to the end of his long, long life, turned back to the theme of Oedipus, that he had broached the time the war was young, and told the story of Oedipus at Colonus. Like Philoctetes, this was a man who had suffered long, suffered for a sin that wasn't his own. And when Oedipus, wandering through Greece, a beggar, ragged, his eyes gouged out, finally comes to Athens, the crowd asks him, Are you that one who killed your father and married your mother? You are the greatest sinner of all time. And Oedipus said, I didn't know I was killing my father. I didn't know that man was my father. I didn't know that woman was my mother. How can I be a sin if I did not know it? Why did the gods send that upon me? I don't know. But I did not sin. And Sophocles shows that Oedipus ultimately found final peace by accepting without question the will of the gods, that the gods send what seems to us to be evil into the world. And we must bear it and take it as our due. 
That was the last play that Soph Sophocles would write as his Athenian country, his beloved fatherland, faced this terrible defeat. There's a wonderful irony in the fact that the generation that went to war in 1914 was the best educated in the classics of any generation that had ever lived. In 1914, the world believed that there would never be another great war, that technology was so advanced, that communications were so rapid, that the world was tied into a global economy, that war was too destructive ever to happen again. But in the summer of 1914, that war broke out. And all these English and German and French boys who had read these classics rushed with enormous ardor into the ranks. And they thought it was one great adventure. And going along right with them was the most handsome, it was said, most brilliant young writer in all of England, Rupert Brooke. Like a young god, many called him. And he was one of the first to enlist. And he was so thrilled along with his comrades when he was chosen to be part of the expeditionary force that would land at Gallipoli in the Dardanelles. Right where Troy had once been and where the archaeologist Schliemann had shown that Troy was located. And they would visit the ruins of Troy and they would go into battle against the Turks there where Achilles and Patroclus and Ajax had fought. To be young, he said, was very heaven as we sailed off to Troy. And there they died in an expedition that was supposed to take just a few weeks. 250,000 young British troops, Australian troops, New Zealand troops would die in the, in the trenches. They would die of the cold and they would learn the horror of war there at Gallipoli. And Rupert Brooke, why he never even got into action. A little island of Limnos, where Philoctetes had once stayed, he got a blister and it turned into blood poison and there he died. And his comrades buried this brilliant young man on a hill looking out over Homer's wine-dark sea. One of the last poems he ever wrote, inspired by a sermon he heard about all the glory of war. If I should die, think only this of me, that there is some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. So this love of country that lured all these young men on this great adventure that was war, that Homer sang of, that Philoctetes suffered for, and that young men and women continue to die for. But let me ask you this. If the Greeks had never sailed to Troy, would we still lecture about them thousands of years later in a world that they didn't even know exist. Achilles chose glory and a short life, and he obtained both. So it is this lure of fame and glory that leads us again and again to the adventure that is war.